Officer Michael McHugh already knew Tennyson long before he was wanted for murder. One morning in January 1980, the chief constable of Holman is faced with the most sordid case of his whole career. He was the first to discover just how violent Michael Tennyson can be. We had uh, uh, received a call at about 2 in the morning from an elderly lady that her home had been broken into and she'd been beaten. The Holman police and La Crosse County traffic police responded. The victim is Lydia Johnson. She's 83 years old. Evidence of the violence she endured that night is visible and marked across her face. It's around 1 a.m. when Michael Tennyson breaks into her house. Just broke into a bunch of houses one night, looking for drug money. The last place that I broke into, somebody come out of the room. I thought he was alone in the house when Lydia suddenly walks into the room. And I freaked out. I didn't think anybody was even there. I'd knocked on the door, and nobody had answered. And you know, so like I'm 20 years old, I was just a kid. So I was trying to get out of the house, and the woman, she just screaming at me, get out of my house, get out of my house. And so I'm trying to find, she jumped on my back. She <laughs> grabbed me and started hitting me in the head. The lady just tenacious, she would not let go. Ended up falling, falling on the ground, struggling, and just trying to get away. She got my hair now, and she bite me, and she wouldn't let me go, and I hit her. Still in shock, the 83-year-old only calls the police a few hours later. Her nose is broken, and she has a few cracked ribs. Once at the scene, the police are able to quickly track down her aggressor, remarkably simply. We discovered evidence at the scene, a cigarette butt, screwdriver, and a ski mask, and also footprints. And this was a bitter cold winter night, and it had just snowed, uh, a light dusting of snow. The officers followed those footprints in the snow for about three and a half miles, uh, right to the suspect's residence. Well, they arrested me the next day. There was snow trash going from her house to my house. That's how drunk I was, you know, two miles down the road, just snow prints all the way down there. Tennyson is arrested for burglary, but in a matter of hours, the case will take a dramatic turn. The victim later confesses to the police that she wasn't only beaten, her aggressor also raped her. So he had admitted that he had beat her. Uh, he had never made any mention, though, at that time the, that he had sexually assaulted her. And the victim at that point had not uh, told the police either that she had been sexually assaulted. Uh, she had been threatened by Tennyson that if she told anyone that uh, he would come back and finish her. And they read the charges to me, sexual assault, the six burglaries and all this stuff. They said I raped her. I didn't rape her. There was no nothing. I don't remember any of that. Why does Tennyson refuse to admit the truth? Medical examinations at the time proved without doubt Lydia Johnson had indeed been raped. My public defender came to me and he said, do you have a choice? They made a plea bargain with me. They got six burglaries and a second degree sexual assault. You can plead guilty to it and get six years. Or you can look at 60 years plus the sexual assault was 20 or 25. He says, you're looking at 85 years if you take it to trial. But when they see that black eye on that lady, you're convicted. Tennyson accepts the arrangement and pleads guilty. He's sentenced to six years in prison. At the end of his sentence, he is placed on daily parole. He is expected to return to his cell in the evenings. It's a judicial decision that will turn out to be a serious mistake. Tennyson commits a minor offense, that of bouncing a check. He claims it was the fear of having to serve another prison sentence that leads him to make a decision that will have severe consequences. I'd been in prison down there six years, and I'd had some real bad experiences in it. I was really terrified about going back. I made a decision that night not to go back to the jail. Tennyson decides to breach his day parole in order to flee Wisconsin. 
to increase his chances, he has the idea of attempting to alter his appearance in this hair salon. On that day, Diane Johnson will unknowingly assist this murderer's escape. It was on the 20th of March, 1987, a matter of hours before the killings took place. He was very explicit on the fact that he wanted to look totally different. I suggested that he would get a different look um, better by changing his hair color and having a haircut. The other interesting thing um, about him in that time of doing his hair, he did not want to take off his coat. He was very emphatic that he wanted to leave his coat on his person. And I found out much later that he did in fact have his gun in his coat pocket. And that is why he did not want to take off his coat. He will use the gun hidden in his coat later that day. To finance his escape, he needs money. So he decides to turn to burglary, a crime for which he's already been convicted in the past. It was cold out, it was a winter. I couldn't go home because uh, police would have found me there because I'd left the jail now. Couldn't stay with friends because I didn't trust any of them anymore. I was sleeping out in a trailer behind somebody's house. They didn't even know I was there. And then finally one night, I just decided to go, you know, over to the Bush residence. It's no accident that he chooses this house. Michael Tennyson knows the Bush family. He had been their neighbor a few years earlier. However, tonight's burglary will be stained with blood. Tennyson is armed and has nothing to lose. At the moment when Kenneth Bush finds him in his kitchen, the killer uses his weapon. The burglary turns into a bloodbath. Kenny pulled a knife out of the kitchen sink. We're right there standing by the kitchen now, and he pulled a butcher knife out of the wash rack, dish rack. And when he did, I had a pistol in my pocket. I shot him. At that moment, Tennyson's urge to kill overcomes him, and instead of fleeing, he decides to wipe out everyone else in the house, one by one. After I shot Ken, Deborah was up in the side room, when she screamed, you know, get the fuck out of my house, and uh, she's gonna call the cops. It's just, because they, they saw my face, I was just, again, I, I was afraid of going back to prison. I heard another noise in a side room. After that, I thought that was it. I didn't even know his mother was there. And she turns on her light. She goes, she goes something like, oh no, what have you done? I saw her there and I shot her. It only takes him a few minutes to completely wipe out the Bush family. A happy family, the kind of family he never had. While his guards thought he was asleep in his cell, the detainee was on the run. The victim's loved ones are still angry that no one noticed that Tennyson was missing from his cell. The main thing I, I, I'm really pissed off about, excuse me, is that he was on work release, he didn't come back, and they didn't look for him. And if they would have found him or if he would have would have made him come back on work release, then this probably would have never happened. What kind of, you know, and then to know that he was out there and they didn't go after him. That's one of the things that really bothers me. The search is on. The Wisconsin police are on the case. Meanwhile, however, the man guilty of three murders manages to escape by bus. He flees to the other end of the states, 1,500 kilometers away. But there, too, Michael Tennyson will strike again. <laughs>